Hi, I'm Anne Marie, and you are listening to Tarot Joy Radio, where underground angels do wonderful things for the earth. And whether it's readings for you, or a guest speaker, or just a topic that seems to be on my mind, I wanted to discuss something today that has been big on my mind for most of my life. And you may be surprised that someone that is a psychic reader or someone that reads as a medium would have an obsessive fear of death. In my 20s, I became radically obsessed about death. This happens to a lot of people in their 20s. For whatever reason, as we are hitting the years where so many master scientists or thinkers or family people are beginning to start to accomplish the greatest things or their most inspiring motivation, their ego becomes at its greatest. And suddenly, the thought of not having an eye, not having a, a personal body or personal passion to be a part of this earth becomes obsessively depressing. It can be to where in my life, I even went without sleep because it was too much like death. I found myself constantly thinking, why did I even get the beauty of having a life only to have it taken away from me? Why do I have to die? Now, that I look back on that, I consider myself lucky and fortunate because at least I wanted to live. There are those who feel the opposite. Why do I have to live? And for those, it becomes an obsessive depression about having to be a part of an earth where so much misery is. I've never been one of those people, but it's still an obsession of death, whether you want it or you don't want it. I guess one of the things that I always contemplated is nothingness. Is there something after death? Is there something that I can count on? And it began to haunt me because I, I felt as if possibly what if it was more like walking around as some kind of thought, the me, but with no body to interact with anybody, to pay attention to me, to acknowledge me. That was terrifying. I guess I was one of those people that wondered why the universe had just tempted me with the beauty of life. Death is like a banquet table. There are so many deaths to choose from. And you can go to war and serve your country. You can get in your car every single day, fasten your safety belt, and brave a highway of drivers, texting, drinking, or failing, falling asleep at the wheel. How much, more, how much more terrifying can that be? It's almost as if every day we are playing bumper cars on the highway. You can choose not to have a pandemic shot. That also is walking with death. We can hurt and hurl through the sky in a rocket, 
and self-choose that. We can climb onto a plane. We can climb the face of a cliff. Or we can risk plummeting to our death on a bungee cord. There are so many ways to die. The odds excite people with bets on the table that they won't die. But today, they will make it. And we have the life insurance policy bet on the table that if we do die, immortality will be in handing our family a cash wad of money. Or we can decide, screw them. We're going to make the best of that money ourselves because they never paid any attention to us anyway. Either way, it's all about death. It's all about afterlife, whether you believe it or whether you don't. Ancient Egyptians built pyramids for life eternal, perfected the art of mummifying the dead to eternity. That's the tricky part. What happens after we die? And here's where so many fear death. No one wants to give up the party of life. More, please. A desire for eternal immortality goes hand in hand with the intelligence of the human brain. It seems as if we've been wired for the concept of God and life after death. It's just engineered and coded spiritual religious experiences. So when you ask me, Annie, how could you have feared death, but then been a spiritual reader, a psychic reader, a psychic medium? Well, the blessing is that as we get older, we start to realize that we're okay. Can I, shall we, you can say mom or you can say your first name or whatever you want. Mom. And then just so I can get a feel for her energy a little more, her real name. Elsie. I didn't know that. <laughs> and then um, again, her real, say mom. Mom. Thank you. She says, thank you for being a logical daughter. <laughs> she feels like um, she's very proud of you. Aww. And she's very proud of the, the way that you conduct business and your life. Aww. She always says also, just remember, if an opportunity comes up in a short time. Don't be so logical that you don't do something new. You need to remember that it's okay for you to try something just a little bit different. Even though she's proud of you for being logical, she just wants you to know that it's okay to try new things. So don't talk myself out of it by being too Yes, logical. by being too logical. She says, one of the things that I have always known about you since you were a little girl is that you're respectful, that you are somebody people love because you care about them, and because... I feel you got that from me, that you are, are of my heart because you are, you, you represent respect to me. Your mom says, I put you 
through a few situations where you had to be out of your comfort zone. And you, you did that yourself too, you know, but you had to be flexible and you had to know when to stay and when to go. And I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm, I still am proud of you. But she says, I also know that there were times during my, my life at the end where you had to be taking on a lot of things at once. And she said that took a lot, that took a lot of flexibility for you. <laughs> she says, I don't get it why women think they have to be so bossy. <laughs> she says, thank you for not being, I'm proud of you for being adaptable and logical, but she says, thank you for not letting it go to your head. She says, I, I like your humbleness. I'm proud of you for the fact that you can be a child of God. You can be somebody that's humble and loves people. And yet you went out of your way for me. We're during a very hard time for you. And she also says, sometimes I think that maybe I was so much like you, except that I didn't have the confidence that you do. She says, there was a part of me that felt a little bit afraid, insecure. And she says, I'm proud of the fact that you're respectful. I'm proud of the fact that I carried myself with respect. I'm proud of the fact that you're flexible and you go out of your way for people. And I'm proud of the fact that you don't let it go to your head. But she says also, the one thing that you probably have that I don't is a little more confidence. Your mom says that one of the things that she always worried about was whether she was being equally supportive for all of her children. She worried that that was a very important job for her as a mom and that for her to be supportive um, and have everybody remember her and have beautiful memories it was really important to her. But she feels like she didn't do it. She feels like in some way she may have fallen short and maybe been a little guilty of favoritism. But she wants you to know that if in any way she did not show you equal amount of attention, that she that her heart was in the right place. She says, I wish I could sit down and have coffee with you. I wish I could talk with you. I wish that I could just have a good long talk with you. But she says, thank you for being common sense, grounded, respectful, and for being all the things that I admire in people. And she says, you are it, daughter, and you are someone that I am very, very proud of. And one of the things she says is, you have a certain sparkle about you that you have kind of hidden and she says, that sparkle is what makes you friends. And she wants you to know she's very proud of you, proud of the sparkle, proud of your respect, proud of your um, just ability to be humble through it all. And she just wishes she could have a nice, long, 
coffee with you or something. So <laughs> that's that's what comes through. Okay. I didn't know your mom, but I think that she sounds like a lovely person. Yes, she was. She accepted everybody for who they were. The club. All right. Erin, could you please say your first name? Erin. Thank you. And then again. Erin. All right. And then one more time. Erin. Thank you. I, I notice you have a fan in back of you, and I have a fan in back of me, so we're, we're right on track here. <laughs> okay, Erin, here is where your energy comes up at this time. Please know I just tell you like I see it, right? Um, one of the things that comes through is that um, you're actually a very empowered person. You have a lot of qualities about you that are, um, they're made in steel, you know, whether that was, whether that life allowed that or not, that's the way you were born. You're also a very supportive person. So that means that if you care about a friend or a loved one, you will go a hundred miles out of your way to be supportive. You walk like you've got diamonds, which means that even if you are broke or even if you don't have a job or even if you have shit hitting the fan, <laughs> there's still a sense that you walk like you have everything going for you. So you're, you're a master of disguise. You have absolutely no doubt that eventually you're going to reach success. And you have no doubt that you're not going to allow yourself to doubt. And even if you do find yourself in analysis paralysis, you snap out of it. Um, you're very flexible, which means that you can bend with the tide. You know, you know how to... Um, you know how to change your life if you have to. If, the li if your life situation requires you to, you will do everything you can to be able to try to not get in the way of progress. Okay, here's where your more in-depth reading comes up. And if you will, say your first name. Erin. And then again, Aaron. and then one more time, Aaron. thank you. The first thing that comes up, Aaron, is romance. And what that can mean is that there is actually someone very special in your life or that you're kind of a romantic person. You kind of have that girl, girly attitude about you that is romantic. Um, it shows you in the next two weeks to two months having to make up your mind between either two people or two life situations. That could be two... Um, friends choosing what you're going to do or choose but it were two vacations or two two people in your life your reading says you've moved on from something that was deeply upsetting for you um, there was uh, especially it shows the number five which indicates that in about five weeks to five months ago you were feeling a little broken because there was something happening that you didn't expect to lose or you didn't expect to happen. But the past says, just remember, all things happen for a reason. And even if you lost something precious to you and from a person or even a job, 
that there's a reason that things happen like that because there's something better coming around the band. You may not feel this way for the next three days to three weeks. You may say, bullshit, but here's the thing. When you allow yourself to just go with the flow, not get in the ways of your progress, because remember, you're very adaptable, you're very flexible. And, it's, and lastly, it says, commitments and responsibilities, family and obligations, career are all around you in the next three months. The one thing you don't want is to be teased by having something come into your life and then have it taken away from you. Your reading says something happened so quickly something happened so suddenly and it was really hard for you to grasp on to the fact that it was that it that it even happened um this is kind of a grudge card it's kind of a get back card and it says for those who hurt you by gosh let them be hurt back <laughs> So in other words, if someone's going to pull a fast one over you, you just hope that they're sorry. You just hope that, that whatever happens will come back to them. On the other hand, it can mean that it may take you another two weeks to two months to be able to go with the flow and to feel better again, not to try to worry about feeling amazing. It'll all get everything. You'll feel whole again in another two weeks to two months. Lastly, it says, remember, if you're going to invest everything you've got into someone or something, always make sure you have a boundary. In other words, if it's a person or a friend or a lover, remember you have to have some boundaries. Boundaries are there to protect you. Boundaries are there so that you don't let someone get to the nucleus, the quick of you, so that you get hurt in a, in a, in a way that heart is hard to be able to repair. So all I'm saying is expect that um, September is going to be a recovery time for you. You're going to feel so much better. You're going to feel amazing. And it says... Um, Ultimately, this is a year where you just need to allow yourself to kick cans, be pissed off, and understand that something you lost is was it was just meant to be, you know, um, and and that the sun will shine again for you, Aaron. Do you have one question for me? Oh, um. Yes, I guess my one question would be that um, I'm sorry. I think you were right. referring to my dog. My dog passed away. If your mascara, so. if your mascara starts to smudge on it. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Hot mess. <laughs> yeah, my dog died in December, and that was oh. really hard. Your yeah. dog. Oh. Yeah. What was your dog's name? Her name was Willow. And looking at Willow. She got sick unexpectedly, but. Um, oh, baby girl, I'm sorry. I'm an animal yeah. rescuer, so I totally get yeah. it. I totally understand. Yeah, she was so, awesome. Can you say her name again? Yeah, it's hard. Okay. Okay, okay one more time, and I won't ask you again. Willow. I love you for feeling that way about your dog. I think that's yeah, awesome. She was really special. She says, thank you, one of the most positive people in my life. She says, you were my universe. I know times I took a lot of maintenance. I know sometimes it took a lot for you to have to do the things you did to take care of me. But she says, 
you were my greatest friend. You were my you were my soulmate. She says, thank you for making me so confident. Thank you up until the end for giving me the life I had. And most of all, she says, get off your ass now and you need to move on so she can be free. But she wants you to know you are her best friend. You are her soulmate and she will see you again. Okay. She'll probably be there waiting for you when it's your time to go. That would be great. Yeah. Thank you so much, baby girl. Um, I will, um, if it's all right, then I will have this on the show. Um, and I didn't mean to show you crying, but um, that's <laughs> okay. It makes it, at all, but. it makes it real. It makes it real. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yep, yep. yep. Thanks, Thank babe. You so much. I really appreciate it. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. I've also had a nephew that killed himself. And he did not feel that way. And I understand for those where life is too 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 hard. You know, we can say why why did they do that why couldn't they have had a, a, a given it one more day one more one more shot but that's easier to say than do so for those people they checked out of earthies a little bit earlier and we have to understand that all of us at some point in our life will check out of earth whether we decide to do it today, whether it happens because we're sick, or whether it happens because we are blessed to have a long life, we all will check out of the earth. But for me, the obsessive fear was of nothingness. And that was in my younger years. Because here's the thing. I was born with a questioning mind. Many would tell you I was a rebel. Many would tell you I had an answer for everything. Many will tell you I still do. But I had a very hard time following. And for that reason, I got kicked out of catechism at the age of 14 in religious study. Because not all people are followers, and they re reject religious ideas. Spirituality is a very private matter, like politics. You can choose to put a big sign in your front yard and shout out your ideas and belief system, or you can keep it to yourself. And I believe there is a passage in the Bible, I cannot recall what it was, that says, that it's far more sacred at times to be able to pray in a room by yourself than to shout it like trumpets in front of a group of people. In other words, I, it's not those words, but I remember it's something like that. I'll have to look for that, that proverb or that, that, that passage. Some fondly called non-believers or atheists feel that all religious following from Catholicism to witchcraft is all about controlling the people. And in a sense, I would have to agree that for me to join the religion of paganism or witchcraft or Lutheranism or Catholicism. No, I don't want to follow. So far from being a comforting thought, some realists can have an obsessive fear of nothingness that haunts them nonstop. They can't help it. They 
cannot stop seeing their demise as leading to nothingness, and the thought of nothingness scares them. They don't love life, but they don't know what's on the other side either. It's scary. It's like going to a job interview blindfolded or to a party where you don't know anybody. What are you applying for? What if you don't like it? Can you quit? Can you go find another, another option? And you can say dad. Dad. And again. Dad. I'm trying to slip into your dad's mode of thinking here. <laughs> your dad says he's glad he's not a part of this world. There's so much going on. He would rather not know about it. That would be him. I've often thought There's that. only one thing that's important to your dad, and that's honesty. Can you believe who you're talking to? And can you believe the salesman or whoever else that you're dealing with? Honesty. Your dad says, I liked a life where I could just be in comfort, be in my comfortable surroundings, be relaxed, but at the same time, an honest lifestyle, something that is real meat and potatoes type thing. But I had a lot of doubts, he says. I had a lot of doubts in my last years. He says, so many of the things that I thought that I knew for sure, I suddenly realized I had second thoughts about, or I had feelings that maybe I wasn't so right after all. Something a lot of people won't know about him that he knows you know. He wasn't the most confident guy. He was steadfast. He liked a relaxed lifestyle. He liked honesty. He didn't care if how much he knew about the world, but he also felt that there was kind of a little part of himself, he says, that was just a little bit afraid of the world. And he says that didn't matter to him because he wasn't one of those guys that lived in their imagination. <clears throat> he wasn't one of those guys that had big, huge dreams that he couldn't reach because what he had is what he wanted and what he loved. <coughs> he wants you to know that he felt he was a wealthy man. Not so much in money, but what he had in kids, what he had in his life, what he had in you, all those things. He says, I was a rich man. I was a man that had good fortune. I mean that I considered that there was probably a lot of things that happened that I could have made different choices. But he says, for the most part, I considered myself lucky to have what I had, to be wealthy in knowing that I did not want more. And he says, the only thing that was extremely important to me was that I have my friends, my family, and to know that they were going to be the people in my last years. I didn't need anything else. I didn't need anybody else. I just wanted 
what I knew, my comfort, my people. And he says, there were a lot of things you don't know that I knew were going on in your life. A lot of things I kept hidden. And a lot of things that I felt about all of you kids. Don't think I didn't know that sometimes you guys talked about me. <laughs> he says, I know it. But he says also, it's okay. Because what I don't know, I don't care. And he just wants you to know he loves you. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for being who you are. And with him in the last years of his life, you are one of those special people that made him feel wealthy and that he was the richest man in the world. And that's what your dad says. Thank you. That was sweet too. <laughs> I think is, I think that the one thing your mom and dad seem to have in common in their readings is they felt they had all they needed and that they knew they could have maybe made different choices, but they're okay with that. Mm -hmm. I think that they are very proud of all you kids and I think they're proud of the choices that they made and their love for each other. And he didn't talk about your mom, mm -hmm. but I think that your mom and him are together. Don't you? Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Sponsor is a chief radio. It's good oh. late. That in the long run, it's all the great mystery at the end of life. No one can tell you differently. No one can make you believe something that inherently you've been wired to somehow acknowledge as your belief. But believe me, beliefs can change with age. Beliefs will change with age. Just like people who make dramatic changes in their life may be deeply sorry for the changes they made later on. Because the wisdom of their years tells them, oh, my gosh, what a silly thing I did. You know, it's okay, though. It's okay, though. So here are the fear of death symptoms. If you know of anyone or a child or a 20-year-old or whatever, as death, pretty much anxiety peaks in the 20s, in most cases, fades as the 30s start to happen. You'll have a sense of anxiety, a sense of dread. You may lose interest in life. You may find yourself becoming deeply, deeply, deeply analytical. You may even begin to take almost a narcissistic attitude. Everything becomes, what about me? That is more like a fear of the approaching of death. But whatever it is, I guess one of the main things that I always also wondered is, do animals obsess about death? Because with each year, there's more evidence that some species are aware of the dynamic of death, like chimpanzees. They seem to have an awareness of death's financial finality. There's a psychologist named James Anderson who's been studying chimps' responses to the dying. In one case, chimpanzees in a safari park reacted to the death of an elderly female with behaviors that included tending to the dying chimp and later avoiding the place where the death occurred. So we can't forget elephants. 
Elephants will linger over the bones of their kind, especially the tusks, becoming agitated and touching the remains with trunks and feet, which has sensitive receptors. How about blue jays and crows and ravens gathering around and they don't touch the dead, but they scream and they scream when they see something that's dying. So does fear of non-existence increase the need for religion? Well, you and I both know a lot of it has to do with how we were brought up, how our religious parents, how their, did they go to church? Did they worship? Did they send us to training, religious training? Because research has proven that religion does give hope and peace for death. Knowing and believing there is an afterlife, whichever faith, that the fear of nothingness is more easily able to go away. Because even the people I know sometimes still fear the approaching of their death but they also are sure that they will go to the arms of Jesus or the arms of their angels. All right, so if you will, say your first name. Annette. Thank you. And then again. Annette. Thank you. And then one more time. Annette. Thanks. I'm clear audience. That means that I pick up the energy around voices and um, sound.